Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've bitten a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Thursday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Elkine, and we're going to be with you for the duration of the hour. We're going to jam-pack show today. Two guests on the docket. First up, 815 will be joined by Mark Chaikin, the founder of Chaikin Analytics. And then at 835, Bill Baruch will join us. He's the president of Blue Wine Futures. But between now and then, we have a lot to discuss. Earnings from Alibaba. L brands, those are the two headliners of the morning. We want we want to have want to discuss some ratings as well, some movers from yesterday's session. So a lot to get to. We'll take your questions from our chat as always. Premarket.benzinga.com, youtube.com slash benzinga TV. Joel, what is happening in the S P futures overnight? Unmute yourself though. Oh, I think I just lost Joel. So hold on, folks, while I grab Joel back and we can get this show rolling. Joel, you're with me. I am. I okay. never. I went to hit the mute and uh, I hit the red. So okay. sorry about that. I'm sure Dennis is listening. He's cracking up. Dennis, uh, I know you're out on your boat uh, listening to Benzinga's pre-market prep. So we're going to give you a big shout out here. SPs are doing exactly nothing. We are unchanged on the session at 61 and a quarter. 61 and 75 was Tuesday's close. That's been the high close of the move. And you got your daily pivot right there. So big day holding the holding green here. See if we can get up to the high of the move at 74 even. Uh, moving on to crude, had a nice day yesterday. Uh, ripped through the 66 and 67 handle, made a high at 68. Oh, four. Here we are trading with a high of 68.12. So there is your resistance in the crude oil market. A uh, little rally in gold seems to be uh, losing some steam here, down $6.10. Uh, silver trading down 17 cents, un unable to clear $15. And Bitcoin, oh, running in the resistance at that same area, 6,800. Little spike yesterday up to 68. 68.80, but that didn't hold. And then you had, what did you have? Nine um, ETFs are rejected by the uh, SEC again. So the again. SEC is not getting on the Bitcoin bandwagon, but I will say the volume has been picking up in the Bitcoin futures. So I think there's some good arbitrage going on. Uh, Spencer, yeah, take it away here. We got to do some earnings. We got some ratings. Yeah. Where would you like to Let's start? Let's start with the... The biggest one in the morning, and that is Alibaba, uh, which reported about an hour ago now. They reported Q1 EPS, a buck and 22 cents, that beat by a penny. The sales 12.229 billion versus an 11.79 billion dollar estimate. Monthly mobile monthly active users in their retail marketplace 634 million people up, 17 million on a quarter over quarter basis. And uh, what are we doing this morning in shares of BABA, Joel? Well, if you were long, you were holding your breath when it went down to 171.16. Then you had a rally all the way up and the next bracket to 184.93. So those are your early parameters. Uh, Spencer, you mentioned that uh, on the pre-pre-market show that someone had talked about an options trade uh, that they put on. And you said the 180 calls. I don't know how far out they're going, but I just want to illustrate how good these option market makers are and uh, also using the pre-market action. Um, the 180 put went out at, uh, this is, or excuse me, the 180 call went out at $3.85. So you needed 183.85 to break even on that trade, okay? Right now, it's up five and three quarters points but you're actually down money. Now, if you have a big enough account and you could have sold stock uh, anywhere, you know, above 184 to 185, uh, you locked in some gains. But uh, just an illustration, man, 
how good those market makers are, how they good they are with those expected moves. So uh, got to be careful when you're paying up the premium. Holding on to the gains, as I said, pre-market high, 184.93. That's a good number to me. 184.5 was your August 3rd high. Um, after that, opens up to 190. But first things first, we got to take out that pre-market high. Uh, is this pulling up the rest of the Chinese uh, internet names? We have Baidu, JD, uh, bigger ones. Are we seeing some any sympathy action with them? Uh, Baidu is uh, trading up a stick, but uh, good chart to bring up here, Spencer, because here you have a couple hundred dollars stock uh, with a triple top at 226 and a quarter. So, folks, write down 226 and a quarter. Uh, for a potential breakout on Baidu, three highs and a, uh, actually three highs and then a double bottom at the 222.40 area. Where were the other issue, uh, the other ones? Uh, we can go JD, look at that. JD, JD trying to get off the mat here. Not much, trading up 41 cents at 32.75. Uh, boom, two pair of highs at 33.50 to uh look at in that one and then man i haven't looked at uh hua in a while man that has a triple top too holy smokes this actually has four highs in the same area called 2770 your major resistance in that b-i-l-i billy a little bit sleepy too uh trading up only 22 cents but follow alibaba that is going to be your leader uh larry glickman's asking about iq Let's see how IQ is doing. IQ is trading up 45 cents here at 29.26. And this has, oh boy, 29.90 or 29.75 uh, double top from the last two sessions. Then you go back even a little bit farther than that, the middle of the month, you had some other highs right there at that 27.80, 27.90. So a lot of good setups here. Uh, but you just want to follow your leader. You follow the Alibaba. And if you're being long these things, you want to see follow through through the pre-market high. All right. Moving on, uh, switching gears from Chinese retail to uh, U.S. retail. Let's go to L Brands. Ooh. They reported yesterday after the bell as I bring the chart up. Q2 EPS, 36 cents. Beat the estimate by two cents there. Sales 2.98 uh, versus $2.93 billion. So good numbers for the Q2, but they are cutting their guidance for the fiscal year. Uh, the Q3 EPS guidance came in extremely light. Uh, zero uh, Flat to a five cent gain is what they said. 16 cents was the, EP, the EPS estimate for Q3. And the, I mentioned the cut of the guidance. That was for the fiscal year EPS that they lowered by 25 cents on the low end of the range from $2.70 to $2.45. Uh, Q2 comps up 3%, but that's not going to, that's not enough to cut it when you're, uh, cutting your fiscal year EPS guidance and your Q3 EPS guidance was extremely light. And do you know who warned us about this stock? Was it someone on our show? Yes, it was. Was it Mark? Nope. Who was it? Our retail expert. Our retail expert, Ryan Craver, the man himself. Yep. Yep. And he sent me an email last night and, yeah, because I, I full disclosure, I do own this as a very, very small percent of one of my portfolios. It's it's even a smaller percent of my portfolios uh, this morning. Uh, pre market low twenty nine forty seven. I don't know if this is going to pull down. You know, pull lows. It's taken out. You know, the low of the move at thirty forty two. Good opportunity for shorts to cover. The week get weaker. The uh, the you know, and this is just. What can you do here? I would keep an eye on the pre-market low, 29.31. That was your low in November of uh, 2011. Your your low in October of 2011 was 27.93. Uh, very ugly looking chart. I mean, if you're really tempted to try along on this one, uh, look at your pre-market low. See if you little get a little flush out under, you know, a new low, and then come back to the open. But uh, Taking out the low of the move, things are not looking good uh, for my L Brands position. 
No, they are not. Uh, the third big one of the morning I wanted to get to was WSM Williams Sonoma reporting uh, again yesterday after the bell. The EPS there for Q2, 77 cents versus a 68 cent estimate. Nice beat. Sales, 1.27 versus $1.26 billion. Columns for the quarter up 4.5%, raising their guidance for the fiscal year, raising the EPS guidance uh, by – why just a couple of cents for the year sales guidance they are raising also uh just by hair but they're raising it nonetheless q3 eps guidance coming in in line q3 sales guidance coming in in line uh to higher uh the estimate was at the low end of the expected range so mostly good news all good news for william sonoma uh they walked it right up on the headline number uh, your pre-market high was 69.40. Uh, that was on two different brackets in the after hours. Uh, we are now uh, over two bucks away from that level. Uh, you found a little intraday pre-market after hours support at 66.30. Trying to get off the mat here. I keep a real close eye on that pre-market high. I don't know if we're going to see that one today. So uh, the spike down, but still holding, I don't think really under any you know, under 66.30, I think you could give some of these gains back. Uh, and going back here on the monthly charts, hmm, you haven't been in the $70 handle. Uh, this was uh, November of 2015, and uh, it had a real bad month that month. It went uh, from 73.75 to 63.33. So may find some, uh, if in fact you could clear that pre-market high, uh, $70, nice round number. I'm sure some people will be looking to sell there as well. All right. We'll do one more uh, earnings and then we'll we'll go grab Mark. Uh, let's, let's do Children's Place, PLCE. They are reporting uh, this morning Q2 EPS, 70 cents versus a 58 cent estimate. Sales, 448 versus $427 million. So beats on the top and bottom line uh, for the second quarter. Again, raising their guidance for the fiscal year. EPS guidance was raised by 14 cents from $7.95 to $8.09. These sales guidance came in higher than estimates. Yeah, a uh, nice move, trading up 760 here at 145.10, your pre-market high, 148.50, you're three bucks back off that level, just kind of hold here. This one looks a little bit weaker uh, than that Williams-Sonoma, you do have some good volume trading. Uh, uh, as far as you go on a monthly perspective here, let's see, oh, I got a number, I like 144.30. Uh, that was your high in March of this year. You are trading above it, uh, but you still be one of those sessions where, you know, your your uh, your after hours pre-market high is much higher than the session high. Keeping an eye on 144.30, uh, we are still holding above it. Uh, obviously hard to find support in the issue if, in fact, it can't hold that 144.30. This is that children's retail store, right? Yeah, I don't understand that uh, children's place. And then um, I thought Kids R Us went out of business. What's uh, what's Build-A-Bear's? Uh, uh, it's like B-B-B-B-B-B-W, something crazy like that. B-B-B-W? It's, I yeah, mean, B-B-W. you know, with, you know, with, uh, you know, people like Dennis buying their kid toys at garage sales. I mean, I don't see how these places survive. The, the rents in these malls is really high. I don't know if they're benefiting from the Toys R Us going out of business, but, uh, you know, nice move if you're long here in uh, Children's Place uh, retailers. I guess the only bad retail earnings is uh, the stock that I own, the L Brands, but uh, not a big deal. We can move on from that. Everyone is hot in retail except for L Brands. All right, 814, we're going to take our first break of the day and grab Mark Chaikin, the founder of Chaikin Analytics. We'll be right back with Mark.
Welcome back, everyone. Pre-market prep, Spencer Israel, Joel Conan, now joined by Mark Chaikin, founder of Chaikin Analytics. Mark, how's it going today? Uh, it's going well. Good morning, Joel. Uh, morning to you as well, uh, Mark. Before we get into the markets, I just want to ask you, uh, I, I know you were uh, doing a, a little thing uh, yesterday with Kramer uh, on, on his site talking about just, uh, I guess, investing or the, the way to approach the market uh, coming from where we are at all-time highs and going forward. What was the general consensus from the two of you yesterday? Well, we talked for an hour about what stocks to own in a booming economy, and uh, the economy is really booming. Uh, you know, top line GDP, 4.1% second quarter. More importantly, revenues and earnings for the second quarter just blew out the numbers, and the expectations are for 20% gains uh, going forward. Now, a lot of people are saying some of that's the tax cut, and of course it is, but that doesn't account for top line growth of 10% in the S&P 500. So we zeroed in on the sectors that are likely to do well in a strong economy and which stocks may be uh, ripe for profit taking. And can you give us some, some love, which, which sectors and which stocks? Well, in a strong economy, particularly uh, when interest rates rise, I don't think it's if, I think it's when. Uh, that's clearly hurt the financials, the flattening yield curve. But the Fed is telling us at Jackson Hole and even previously rates are going up. You want to own the cyclical stocks. So you want to own technology, energy, industrials, and financials. And what you want to be selling in here, in my view, are the defensive stocks, which have had this miraculous five-week rally, the utilities. Consumer staple. Mark, you with us? I think we may have lost Mark. I'm not sure. Mark, are you with us? No. Okay. Wow. Twice in one day. This is unusual. Dennis can't leave the show because this is what happens. All right. I don't know why how we lost Mark, but I'm going to get Mark back in a jiffy. Hold on one sec, folks. All right, I got Mark back. Uh, Mark, you were talking about the utilities uh, and why you don't want to own them, but we lost you after that. Uh, utilities, consumer staples um, have gotten very, very overvalued and overbought. You had a five-week move in the defensive stocks that actually makes no sense to me, but Wall Street doesn't always make sense. Uh, it, it almost felt as if they were thinking interest rates were going to drop down below 2.5 on the 10-year. The group that's most controversial here, I think, is healthcare. Stocks like United Health and Centene have had extraordinary moves. Wellcare, WCG, I think, and Kramer uh, started to come around to that, that these stocks are candidates for profit taking. Very difficult to take money off the table in a stock that's treated you so well over the last six to 12 months. But if you lump healthcare into the defensive category, and historically they've been there, then these big moves um, cry out for taking some money off the table. All right. What about retail? You've got Brian Cornell, the CEO of Target, saying it's it's the best he's ever seen. The retail environment is the best he's ever seen. Uh, Target's at all-time highs. Everyone, not everyone, most everyone uh, popped on earnings, had a, a tremendous quarters in the retail sector. Uh, how are you approaching retail right now? Well, I think the consumer is flush with money, including the millennials. So there's a theory that I have that the millennials are going to drive the next phase of this bull market. I think the analysts on Wall Street really got fixated on the uh, Amazon um, you know, Death Star approach to retail and assumed that bricks and mortar were dead. So the earnings estimates were very low. And as you say, except for a couple of um, outliers, uh, these companies have come in very, very strong. Nordstrom, Kohl's, uh, Urban Outfitters, you name it. The one that I really like here is the one that had been leading the pack to new highs, which is Macy's. Macy's basically beat the numbers. Uh, the theory was that they're having a hard time growing revenue, which is not new, but they are 
doing a reboot in terms of getting digital and the internet into the stores and so forth. So Macy's had a 16% pullback. It's uh, bottomed out, rallied a bit. I'd be a buyer of Macy's on weakness. Uh, the numbers were great. It was at new highs before the earnings print. That's always a little bit risky. So I think uh, retail across the board is viable, but you don't want to pay up on these spikes. You want to wait for pullbacks. Uh, buyer on pullbacks in Macy's for a, is this for like a, a swing trade or is this for for a long, longer term play? How long is your horizon here? Well, I think if the bull market's going to continue, and I, I believe that it will, uh, it's a longer horizon. It's three to six months, uh, but you do have to see a pullback. But he, he got the sixteen percent pullback. Macy's basically gave up a month's worth of gains in one day, and now it started to retrace that. Brings up another point, though. Earnings season is now over, but we have these scattering of retail reports coming out mm-hmm. between now and October. My observation in the last three earnings seasons is that if a stock is making new highs going into the earnings print, that's vulnerable. You may even want to sell it before the earnings come out. On the other hand, if the stock is pulled back prior to the earnings, it means expectations are not quite as high. And then if you get a better than expected number, you can actually stay with the stock a little longer. Normally, we like to sell spikes after earnings. really depends on what the setup was prior to. So I, I think the consumer is very flush with cash. We all know the economy and the labor statistics, you know, unemployment, new lows, uh, unemployment claims, uh, very uh, you know low and so forth. So I think millennials have a lot of mobility and they have a lot of cash and they're spending it. We're not sure if they're spending it on homes. They're not spending it on homes. That's even better for retail because they're spending it on you know, discretionary goods, on games, on, uh, you know, restaurants and so forth. So I think uh, the consumer may drive the next phase of this bull market. We're on the line with Mark Shaken of Shaken Analytics. Joins the show every couple of weeks to share his insights uh, on the market. Uh, talking about the Macy's move and uh, just taking a look at Urban Outfitters yesterday. Uh, similar, you know, had the big spike, but uh, ended up uh Finishing the day on the red in the red, we went to 52.50, went down as low as 44.91 with the 45.48 close. Uh, two questions here. Uh, one, you know, you've been on the big desks and everything when you know with, uh, with institutions that owns you know a lot of these stocks and whatnot. I mean, do you think this is a point that this stock had been you know under seventeen dollars a little over a year ago? You're looking at you don't get any better news than this in time to take some profit taking um, or, you know, maybe some aggressive shorts. Then second of all, is this a candidate here to do what Macy's did and, uh, you know, bottom uh, right after uh, the print in which uh, the good they got good numbers? Well, I think this is a little different than Macy's in that okay. you got the initial enthusiasm up to new all time highs. So uh, this is typical of what we've seen in sectors where there's a big dichotomy uh, analysts on the one hand uh, still adhering to this Amazon Death Star theory you know bricks and mortar are dead and then they see the numbers and a lot of hedge funds are were short these stocks so uh, uh, speaking to what goes on in the dynamics of a trading desk you get hedge funds who are short coming into an earnings report uh, they see a big number they're almost forced to cover. Uh, and the public does jump in, sadly. Uh, that's why we never recommend buying a spike up after earnings. It almost never pays. You wait for a pullback and things to settle down. So uh, I'm not sure about Urban Outfitters. They're okay. based here in Philadelphia. Uh, so we know, you know, we, we watch them closely. Uh, clearly, the, the chart is phenomenal. Uh, I think Macy's has a broader footprint. They're everywhere. Yeah, uh, they got a lot of real estate. Not like Sears, uh, they're actually making money, but they are selling off some of their real estate. So Macy's is redoing itself. Urban Outfitters was weak, uh, as you say, down to seventeen because they missed trends. So you know they 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 for a couple of quarters they just didn't get the merchandise right. Macy's, on the other hand, is doing a, a total reboot to try and get digital and internet incorporated into their revenue stream. They're doing a good job of it. I shop at Macy's on the way home from the office. I walk past it. They're giving you great incentives to come back with specials, family day, and and so forth. So I hadn't shopped in Macy's for 20 years. 
and they have good uh, merchandise and they're giving you incentives to come back and it's building traffic. So, you know, this is an anecdotal way to look at a stock that had been making new highs, but across the board, retail is interesting. It, it'll be a challenge now for the analysts to get on board this moving train. Because if you had so that, uh, if, you had that urban out, if you had that Urban Outfitters pizza yet, I have because it was a an independent <laughs> restaurant chain before, and we eat in their restaurants all the time. They have a chain called Amis, which is actually as good or better than the pizza place, and they're starting to open. They open in Westport, Connecticut, and I think they're opening in Chicago, actually. So that's also the original Amis is on my way home. Um, I don't know what Urban Outfitters is doing in the pizza <laughs> business, quite honestly. You know, all uh, right. Yeah, a little strange. With the financials, uh, you, you talked about, uh, you know, being a little bit bearish, the utilities and whatnot, uh, maybe looking for an uh, jump in interest rates here. Uh, let's just talk about uh, the XLF. And if you're, you know, if you're going for higher interest rates, could you give us a couple of your favorite bank stocks? I can. I mean, this has been a challenging group because it of the has. yield curves. JP Morgan, clearly the best management in the business, uh, and their move on uh, Tuesday uh, to announce free brokerage. I didn't realize Chase had 47 million banking Me customers. neither. That's the equivalent of the whole online brokerage business I right know. there. That's huge. So free, free brokerage, portfolio construction, and then in January, robo. Why are they doing this? Well, A, they have great management. Two years ago, they hired a woman named Kelly Kehoe. You may know her. She ran Schwab's active trader business. So in less than two years, she's come into JPM with Jamie Dimon's blessing. She's done something in retail that they were never able to do. And the reason is they want to capture the millennials. It's not about the brokerage transactions. It's about keeping the money in-house. And millennials are very attracted to free brokerage. Look at Robinhood. So I think JP Morgan has the best management in the business solid, don't make big mistakes. And then in the regional banking area, key banks and SunTrust, particularly SCI, love SunTrust. And then you've got to look at payments. I know it's not strictly speaking financials and banking, but global payments is obviously taking over the world. I think you have two big choices there. You can go with PayPal, which um, sort of cut guidance for the third quarter and announced a big buyback, which made people nervous because usually they reinvest funds. Or you can go with Visa. I think Visa is the clear-cut winner in the payment space. There's another millennial story, Joel, in Visa. They're very big in debit cards. They almost dominate the market. Millennials hate bank debt, and they love debit cards. So uh, Visa really has the technology uh, to expand globally, uh, doing a lot in Europe now. And this whole debit card business is still very, very important. Mark, well, but let me put a yeah. button there. You may have to sit with these stocks a little longer uh, because the yield curve continues to stay flat because there's been artificial pressure on the 10-year yield because the U.S. economy is so strong, the dollar has been strong, and interest rates here are much higher than they are in Germany and, uh, and across the globe. So once the 10-year starts to see the yield got back up around 3 maybe get over 3%, the financials should really fly. A more immediate group to buy here would be energy. Seasonally, it's the right time to be buying energy. This is a three-month period when energy normally outperforms. Uh, Mark, last one, and I'll let you run. Is there any chip stocks you're liking right now? Uh, Micron uh, has, has held its own. Uh, I would avoid the chip manufacturers for the time being, AMAT and LAM Research, I think. Uh, we don't know what the chip outlook is, but Microsoft, uh, Micron took such a big hit uh, that I think it's viable in here. And one last name, I mentioned Microsoft by mistake. I'd be taking money off the table in Microsoft. Why? Huh. Because Nardella, the CEO, sold $36 million worth of stock up here. They've got the lowest yield they have in 10 years, and their P-E ratio at 28 is the highest it's been in 10 years. This stock is being priced like a cloud computing company. And I don't think it deserves this kind of multiple. So it's got a bullish rating in Chaken Analytics, but I'd be taking money off the table of Microsoft. You and Dennis both. All right. That's <laughs> going to be it for us today. Mark Chaken, thanks so much for coming on today. Always appreciate your insights. Have a good one. 
You too. Thanks, guys. All right. 8.30 now. We've got about five minutes until our next guest, uh, Bill Barrock, uh, joins us. Joel, was there any reaction to anything Mark said that you agreed no, or with? Uh, um, no, no. I mean, he's good. I mean, uh, you know, these uh, financials have uh, been in a, a, a trading range here. Um, and it's just, you know, waiting for the next move on um, interest rates. Uh, the Micron, I, you know, we got a Micron gets a lot of love here. And, um, you know, I know Dennis has been sticking with it long term, does have a nice formation. You know, just for me, I, I mean, this stock has just had such a major run. A lot of these chip companies are, you know, are cyclical. I, you know, I just don't know. I just don't know about this one in the long run. Uh, so I'm not I'm not that hot on uh, Micron. Uh, but, you know, we shall see. It does have a, a nice bottom to lean on here. And uh, NVDA, NVIDIA. Uh, shrugging off, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Citron, Mr. Livestock comments that continues to be a beast. So go with the winners and oh, nice formation here. If you are trading uh, NVDA yesterday's high 263.02, your high going back, got a couple other highs in the 263 handle. And uh, we were also talking about uh, AMD. And holy mackerel, twenty-one dollars stock there had the consolidation, and uh, boom, consolidation to go higher. Let's talk about the follow through from yesterday. Uh, we were amazed on yesterday's show about Lazy Boys uh, action uh, LZB here. Uh, they're catching a downgrade this morning uh, from KeyBank uh, overweight to sector weight. I think that's just uh, you know a sign that you know the stock is a little overdone, but Joel, give us, <laughs> I mean, a little overdone is an understatement, but give us your thoughts here on, on, on Lazy Boy with yesterday's session in the books. Uh, well, it was uh, it was way overdone at 40 bucks. Did you see that during the pre-market session? What did it do? It opened up. Here's another thing where you have a high in the pre-market, which was 40 even. You had a 38.75 high uh, or 38.75 open. So here's the situation, you know, kind of the whoop straight. I've talked about this with something that uh, I, I know Dennis is one of his favorite strategies. You open up. So let's say you short the open and the thing's over 39 bucks and you're scratching your head saying, man, maybe that wasn't that good of a trade. But once you came back down through that open and you would have had to have been quick and I don't know what kind of slippage you would have got on stock on that. Uh, but uh, there, that was a heatless trade. And then you use that 39.15 as a stop. We went all the way down to 35.60 with the 37.45 close. I expect this one to back it, fill here. I mean, I uh, traded uh, a million uh, two days ago, three million yesterday. New all-time high for Lazy Boy. Um, I'll try and get one of my uh, my buddies uh, from Monroe on to talk about it. But uh, And maybe, you know, Spencer, maybe we should give the Lazy Boy Jaws story. Maybe we'll give that a rest for about a year here stuff. You know, I think. We've been uh, been using that quite a bit, but uh, they also did something in the housing sector, or not housing? Did it? They uh, downgrade TPX as well, or or upgraded? I'm sorry, TPX, Temper Sealy. Uh, was that this morning? Uh, let me see what I have on my dock here. I thought I saw TPX up to P- a key bank. All right. Yes, it did. Upgraded call. Upgrade to overweight TPX. Big move. Big, big, big move here. Uh, last print is at uh, fifty nine. You got to print at fifty nine fifty. But that was uh, that was a hundred shares. It's kind of weird things going on here. Uh, you had that a spike up to fifty nine fifty, which was a pretty good volume. Then you sold off last night. I don't know. I'd have to wait till the real liquidity comes in this one. 59, oh, maybe that was a closing print from yesterday. 59.51 was uh, yesterday's high. We'll keep an eye on that for potential resistance. All right, 8.35, we're going to take our final break of the day and grab Bill Baruch, president of Blue Line Futures. We'll be right back in a moment with Bill.
Welcome back, everyone. Pre-market prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Elkanen, joined now by Bill Baruch, president of Blue Line Futures. Got him up on my screen right now. Bill, how's it going today? Going great. How are you guys doing? Doing Thanks for me on. Doing excellent. Doing excellent. Uh, market. We're at all-time highs. We're in the longest bull market ever. If you go by certain definitions, uh, give us your macro take right now. We'll start from there, and then we'll get micro. I don't see a reason to be fighting this market. I, I think we're heading higher. I, I think yesterday's Fed minutes were, were exactly what we wanted to hear. Their inflation expectations softened just a bit. And Fed is really in the driver's seat. There's, there's a lot going on in the markets uh, or, or the news domestically and geopolitically. But really, you know, we got to come back to the fact that the Fed is in the driver's seat. They're, they're priced in to hike uh, in September. They're, they're priced in about 66% in December and even about 30% in March. Their path is set. And as long as that path doesn't really go much faster, the market is going to have a path of least resistance higher. And we've got, you know, Jackson Hole uh, this week. Uh, you know, I, anything particular that you, you're looking for out of that? I, I never really put too much stock into, into headlines until I, until I really see them uh, follow through in the market. But is there anything you, you're looking for as far as comments this week? Yes. You know, the uh, Fed Chair Powell talks at 9 a.m. tomorrow, central time tomorrow. And I, this is going to be key because earlier in the week, President Trump was you know, firing shots, everything from the U.S., right, right, of right. everything from Europe and China to, to the Fed's path of hiking rates. And some people out there think that you know, the Fed might try and show its independence by, by moving faster. I do not think that's even in the cards. I, I think ultimately you know, we're going to see them sort of just continue this slow, monotonous uh, path of hiking rates. And he's going to confirm that. I think we see the dollar move lower from his con from his talk tomorrow. I think we continue to see rates move down. I'm, I've been a buyer in treasury prices every time these things dip. Um, you know, there's some resistance here in the 30 year, but I would love to see a little bit of a dip today to be a buying opportunity. Um, so I, I think too, with, with the dollar weakening, you know, you're seeing gold consolidate off of some really big washout levels. I would pay attention if gold definitely gets above 1210. You can start seeing a, a squeeze on some shorts there. I, I think his conversation tomorrow on monetary policy is going to be pretty critical um, in setting that path for the currencies in the dollar. Uh, as soon as we uh, mentioned we were having you on, uh, someone in our, in our chat said, great, because you've been hot on oil recently. So give us your thoughts on oil. Yeah, you know, I, I think oil is heading to 80 bucks. I, I think that we're going to see this move here happen later half of the year. Dips are buying opportunities. And when everybody kind of gets nervous, you, you see oil exacerbate to the downside. You have to remember that there is an overcrowded long trade. But ultimately, open interest has been expanding too. So I, I, take, it, I take the overcrowded long trade with a, with a grain of salt. And I, I look at spare capacity, which is at decade lows uh, and is going to be a really bullish factor as demand picks up later this year. Imports were picking up over the past couple of weeks. And that inflated the, the overall builds in, in crude oil and gave a more bearish picture. However, last week's data showed that imports fell off hard, about a one and a half million barrels uh, per day. And, and I think really what you want to look at there uh, is refinery utilization remains high, uh, demand remains high. So if these imports aren't coming into the United States, we're going to start to see those inventories start to dip off. And that's going to be a very bullish catalyst later this year. We're on the line with Bill Baruch. He's the president of Blue Line Futures. Uh, talking about the crude oil market here, it seems like a lot of these moves either emanate or take place uh, in the overnight session. Um, I like to put a lot of emphasis um, on the close, uh, you know, the 2.30 cash close, the after hours action until five o'clock and then if I'm going to do something in the issue, I'd like to do things off that uh, 6 p.m. open. Um, you know, how do you, are, are you just taking things? Are you just, baby, you know, trading during the cash market time from 9 to 2.30? Are you incorporating uh, the overnight moves and how much emphasis do you put on that 6 p.m. open? Well, what's important is really to have a roadmap. And, and that's what we do at Blue Line Futures for our clients is we put out research every single day, whether it's gold, crude oil stocks, the S&P, corn, or, or livestock, we can stay consistent with this research and it, we give our, our bias, our levels that are important ones to watch, a major three-star support or a major three-star resistance. 
you know, you saw crude oil in the early hours last week hit a uh, hit a 200 day continuous moving average. Those are, you know, if you're planning on seeing that, or if you if you know that's a buying opportunity down there, you're not getting scared when this thing's washing out. So you're we're watching some of these levels, and you have that roadmap plan. You know, you don't want to be forcing trades in, in a thinner market. And, and I agree with you that that two thirty Eastern settlement is very key. And after that, it starts to get a little wishy washy. But you want to have those levels known. And with the market is testing those levels, uh, you got to be prepared to act as long as it's in with within your game plan. What kind of risk reward ratios do you like to use in the crude oil market? I mean, this thing can move, you know, 50, 75, th- you know, a buck pretty quickly, uh, um, you know, or the overnight. What kind of what kind of risk reward ratios do you like to use in crude? That is a really great question. And, you know, in working with different clients, I have different clients that, that want to take on different amounts of risk. You know, personally, I like to look for the market to, I, I have a more of an intermediate, longer term perspective. And I'm looking for, you know, in crude, really, where's the next three to five percent? So buying down uh, against that washout or against that that move last week and, and the week in the week prior, sixty eight bucks was my target to the upside in the near term. Now you have to be trading off of that, and you want to, you know, I ultimately think it is going higher. You want to be protecting that. Um, but to answer your question more precisely on risk reward ratios, a lot of people have a perception that you're going in there, you're take 10 or 20 cents on a regular basis. Oh. That's not my trade. <laughs> oh, no way. Anybody, yeah. I don't think anybody out there really is doing that or can do that. And hey, if you can, great. All, all power to you. But, you know, I, I like to look at getting into something and, and staying with it uh, until the bigger levels are, are broken. And I'm buying into support until support's broken. So if I'm looking for, you know, if, you're, if we're buying around 65, we're not picking that low necessarily, but we're buying into and prepared to buy into 62 and a half. And in, in a lot of the clients too, we manage risk by using options around that. So if you, we kind of want to make sure you're looking at and, and you know, we'll, down to there, are you comfortable being long down to there? So then we want to, we want to make sure you're not just, you're not just blindly buying, but we're, we're using puts to protect that downside as well. All right, Bill, let's switch gears and go to the, uh, the equities a little bit. Uh, you're on CNBC a couple of days ago talking about Netflix. Can you outline your your bullish Netflix thesis here? You know, I, I think Netflix definitely fell off the quarter two with their earnings. And, and I think one of the big things there with earnings, obviously, was this subscriber growth. This is a number that's that's been huge for for the you know any of the social media, uh, as well as Netflix and, and these and these growing um uh, these, these, these growing types of businesses, you had the World Cup, you had better weather. This is not. This was not really their their quarter to shine. I think we're going to see Netflix really have a very strong second half of the year, very strong fourth quarter. Uh, we can start to see some of those numbers start to come in at the end of the third quarter. Technically speaking, the chart has done absolutely nothing wrong, and I, I expect it to really start to show that leadership again. But they they have their own content and. Producing that content is really making it a, a huge competitor to some of the bigger names. In fact, it has become a bigger name. So I, I think really it's – Netflix is a place to be, and, and, and really there's value when you look at some of the some of the more behemoths in the market right now relative to Amazon or an Apple. Netflix has, has sold off quite a bit from its low. It's, it's up a, a bit pre-market. had a good day yesterday too, but I, I think you're looking at relative to where it's been through this year. There's, there's value in Netflix relative to the other big names. Can we get your thoughts here on Alibaba? We were talking, you know, retail this morning, earnings, of course, Baba reported this morning. Uh, thoughts here on, on Baba? Well, it, it's, it's ripping higher, you know, and the one thing that concerns me about this stock, though, it's always about one headline away from, from falling apart. You know, <laughs> there is some good support from previous lows. You look back to April, May. Uh, and we tested down it down below 170, but it's been a level that over the past since since even winter of last year, we've been hitting against this level for quite a bit. So there is support down here. I, I do see now that we've really, really broken below the 200 day moving average in August, it's going to be a big headwind. I, I if you're a buyer down here trying to find some value, you know, you, you want to be careful looking 185, 186, 187 is going to be a very tough level to get out above. You mentioned the 200-day. Uh, that brings me to, to a good point. What 
indicators do you place most emphasis on and why? You know, I, I like to look in the longer term, my intermediate to longer term. So the 200-day moving average is, is, is a big level that, 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 especially with single equities, I like to watch. Uh, you know, with, with coming to more commodity focus in my research and clients that I, that I you know, work with and, and trade with myself, I, I like to really use a lot of fib retracements. I use those moving averages. Um, and I, if something's above the 50-day, I, I think that we can, you know, you want to be a buyer, roughly speaking. I have some more proprietary ways of looking at it. Um, but, you know, I, I am looking at the, I'm, I don't get too much on my screen. You know, a lot of people have charts on there that, that you're, you can't really, you can't really tell where the, which, what, what line is the actual market. And, <laughs> and I, I think that's, that's just too much. I like to keep it really simple. You know, the moving averages, I, I like to use the fib retracements. I go a, a lot with, with feel. And uh, I draw, I draw trend lines. I mean, I, I draw, I draw a lot of lines, and I'm erasing a lot of lines. And I find out what, what feels right. Did you steal my star system from me, Bill? I like to do that, like with, uh, you know, with different asterisks and putting stars. Did you, did you steal that from me? I've been doing that for quite a while. I'm <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like that though. I mean, it, it, I, I think that's the way to go. Uh, so where, where's your? Uh, so just looking at oil here, recap oil. Like when you like you make Wednesday's high, that was uh that was sixty eight oh eight. So mm -hmm. I mean to me, it has to prove itself more than once, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I I make that a two star. Now the fact that sixty eight twelve has been the the high so far, tomorrow I'll bump that up to a three star because you have a potential double top. Uh, but to me, you know, really if crude really gets going into the upside here. Um, I don't have a three star until 69.34. And the only reason I'd have that is because you had two highs, one on August 7th at uh, uh, 69 and a quarter and another one at 69.34. So uh, you, are you seeing any uh, any confluence with uh, that in your levels? This, this is a great question. You know, and I want to tie in your previous question about risk reward too. You know, and the way I look at it, I'm looking with crude really, you know, where's the next three to 5% in the market? Mm -hmm. For the S&P, I'm looking at where's the next one to 3% in the market. Gold, gold's more along the lines of that three to 5% as well. And, and that's just due to the volatility difference between commodities and, and equities and leverage that we're using. For, for crude oil, my three star has been 67.72 to 68.10. Since since when we were down below sixty five bucks, so this is a level you want to be trading against. And ultimately, you know, when we're buying down below, we're, I'm working with clients in the sense of having the, the the right amount of risk. You're comfortable to see this even go a dollar against you. I'm not picking anything. You know, I'm not picking that bottom. The bottom's a process, and to make that more comfortable on buying, we're, we're buying puts against it. For the same way, if we want to stay long, and I think this thing has a bigger bigger upside here. We're using, we're selling calls and taking something off the table against this hit against 68 bucks, but we're, we're really keeping a core position on. Now, above here, I do see some some resistance I have next is, as a two star call, key level 68.86, 69.19. And then, and then above there is, is a right, a right above 71 bucks. I don't have another three star until 72.95. So, so ultimately, for me, you know, when I'm using these key levels to trade against and, and, uh, but, but ultimately I'm looking for that momentum confirmation. So I need to see a close above 68.10 in order to confirm that momentum, okay. confirm, yep. confirm that breakout. So it's, it's less on the, less on the smaller swings and I'm more focused on that bigger intermediate term to longer term swing. Uh, listen, if, if we're building a position on that drop last week and it's below 65 bucks, uh, have no problem. You know, take fifty cents or seventy cents on on the first test up there. You know, sixty five thirty trade against it or something, and and you, you can take. You know, I have no problem looking for the sm some smaller trades around a core position when the market's moving with us. But I'm never going to get into a position looking for looking for thirty or fifty cents. All right, Bill. Last one, and we'll let you we'll let you run. If you are so bullish, oil, give us one good offshore play. Ooh, offshore play. You know, one of the one of the ones that I am looking at. You know, I and it's okay. You don't have to have one. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, I don't want to make you. Come on, it's been great in Spencer and you. Or it's BZ Tokyo in here, uh, or an ETF, Bill. No. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're not, we're not going to be here. Give me one second. 
EOG resources, one I'm talking about. Now, this is not necessarily may fit what you're looking at for, but I think this one here, EOG resources, is, is one that has sold off recently, gotten now down to the 200-day moving average. I think there's a good, a very good amount of value here for the long term. And you're seeing a double bottom against the June low. And this was really like a breakout area where we had January high, and then we broke out above that January high in May. And now we built a base to June there, and then we retested this. Now you have the 200-day moving average right below it. I think this is positioned really, really well to be able to, to, to move higher. And I would not be surprised to see that take out the 130 level for the end of the year. All right. Bill Rook has been out with us, president of Blue Line Futures. Uh, Bill, thanks so much for the time. Great, great segment. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. All right. 8.53 now, guys. About seven minutes left in our show for the day. Joel, uh, any, any We're more? stuck. We're stuck, We're stuck. Spencer. I know. I, I, don't I, know. Know. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, Spoos are holding up here, 50 cents, 61.75. That's been your high close of the move, 61 and a quarter. Uh, that was your settlement from yesterday. Uh, yesterday's high, 68, two-day high, 74. So quiet Thursday here, uh, I guess, for the uh, the pre-market low of 57.50, just hanging out mid-range. I just say the longer you hold that uh, that pre-market low, 57.50, uh, greener skies ahead. Uh, no, no time to fight the, uh, the trend today. Maybe uh, tomorrow, but uh, not today. All right, let's go to uh, some. This, the only real headline I saw since the show started, and that is Honeywell, who oh, yeah. uh, announced a guidance raise at around eight twelve, raising their fiscal year EPS guidance uh, from eight dollars and five cents on the low end of their range to eight dollars and ten cents. So a five cent raise on the estimate. Uh, they said they uh, con- they cite continued confidence in the strength of their end to end and growth uh, end markets and growth in long cycle orders and backlog as well as an accounting change. Uh, and what else do they say? They are going to spin off their transportation systems, Garrett in Motion. Uh, what else did they say? They expect the spinoff to close at the end of Q3. I tell you, every day that Honeywell employees walk into work, they should thank the Lord that, or whoever they want to thank, that uh, the EU did not let them take over General Electric. Uh, this was back. It was a big art play on and uh, they squashed it. And man, they have gone in opposite directions. I think this was in like the early 2000s. So uh, nice move in Honeywell. I'll give you your pre-market high. Your pre-market high comes on at 159.60. We're not trading a ton of volume here. So you're going to need some big buyers to come in to support that level. All-time high, 159.99. We made that on the first day of the month, uh, which was uh, August 1st, obviously. So you don't know. Take a peek. If you go another buck, you get near that pre-market high, you have the open book, and just be careful. Take a look to see if there's a big seller at 160. But uh, on the upside here, uh, Honeywell looking good, and so far holding on to its gains. All right. Uh, we talked about a couple of ratings. Were there any more we wanted to hit? We discussed Lazy Boy Weeks, uh, discussed TPX. Uh, Edna caught a downgrade, yeah. caught a downgrade, downgrade this morning at Cantor Fitzgerald. Let's look at AET. Mm, okay. Well, I don't mind. I don't mind this downgrade here because you've had a nice run up on the stock. Um, it got the the big bump. Who was it? Who was it buying? Was it? Um, well, Maybe it wasn't. That was signifying. Anyways, it was probably an earnings jump. You got a nice bump. You made a new all-time high at 199.95. I mean, if I own the stock long term, I'm not selling in on this news here. Uh, very little volume is traded at uh, 197.03. Uh, looking at the low from yesterday, 197.70. Uh, I keep an eye on 197. Your uh, your five-day low is 196.98. And then your six day low is 196.04. So I could see some profit taking in this one. Uh, started the year out at uh, hmm, uh, not great, uh, 180.39. So it's had a nice little bump. I mean, if you want to take profits in here in this one, fine. I don't know if I'd like be getting carried away uh, shorting it. So uh, Etna uh, getting the downgrade. Uh, we're getting some questions now uh, in, sure. in the YouTube chat. An update on NE. 
W. Yeah. I don't really know Good what to, I don't really know what to say here. Nothing. I don't know what what there is to say. I mean, it it it, it bottomed out. I guess that's it. I don't know. <laughs> and we still don't have any news on this one. Last I checked, I didn't see anything. I can check again. <sighs> Did you guys call the company? I I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I no, can, yeah. I mean that's one thing I know you guys are great at doing. Yeah. You, you know, you, I, I saw that the comments came. I just wondered if uh, the users of their phones are ringing off uh, uh, off the hook here, but um, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, someone had a reason for selling this thing, um, and you know what? The volume really picked. This is interesting because you had the big down day, uh, three point three million, but then you had the up day, uh, and the up day was nearly seven million. So. I don't know what to tell you. If you want this thing to keep going, you need to get up up 13 and a quarter. That was yesterday's high. I think a bull case here, long, you know, better scenario instead of this thing running right back up. Maybe get three, four, five days of consolidation and then, you know, bust out, you know, wherever the high of that congestion area is. But uh, it's tough. Oh, Carson Block was the one to get this one. Did we? Uh, Wait, what? Where are we seeing BC that? Tokyo said, Get car. Oh, th- he said, get Carson oh, Block. No, so I, 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 I don't, don't know if that. he's uh, if yeah. he's the one. I we didn't see any news on that one, but uh, look for a couple of days of consolidation and perhaps this thing can uh, regain its footing. All right, I'm gonna uh, in the next few minutes just kind of run through the chat. Uh, sure, was there any that we missed? There was one from the top of the show that I saw. Oh, I, I don't know if, is, if this is a ticker or TXRC, is that or may, maybe they meant yeah. TR. TXRC. So I, so yeah, that was from uh, BZ Tokyo here. It was uh, I had it up here. TXRC, right? Or I, I think I think TR oh. TRXC is one. I think that, that could be what he meant. Okay, so take I dirty took a look. Um, he's talking about this five fifty level here. Uh, trading up fourteen sets at uh, five twenty six day run in here. So may need a little breather, but. Man, all oh, those highs at 550. I'll give you 550, 552, 549, 548, 545. So five highs in a row. I mean, surely if it gets through that level, um, you got a potential breakout, $6 area. I have absolutely no idea what this company does. Nice bump in volume yesterday. So that's good. From 3 million to 10 million. Uh, and you know, you might, if, yeah, if, you if, might if, need some news or some, uh, um, or something. If Dennis were here, he would note what BZ Tokyo just did, that this was uh, John Nigerian's, uh, or Pete Nigerian's final, uh, had this on his final call yesterday. So we know Dennis is is trading those uh, those CNBC guys. Uh, I don't know what time that that occurred. Let's do one more. Let's look at... Uh, G. Someone wants to know if you still got your G, Spencer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I ain't scared. I'm not scared. <laughs> Come on. I, I ain't scared of $12. Come at me with 10, then we'll talk. <laughs> okay. Long. Uh, well, this, uh, I haven't looked at it in a while because there hasn't been much news on it, but uh, you did have that spike low uh, down to 1194. Someone buys this thing at the whole numbers. I don't know if they just wait and sell it at the next quarter or the next half, but uh, you got that little shakeout under 12, and then you had three highs right at uh, 1235, 1240. You broke that. Uh, now I'd say ne- next up. Uh, Take out 1270 here. Last two days highs, 1262, 1269. Maybe get up to uh, the $13 level. I will note here on the monthly chart here, I, I don't even know if I can count all the down months that it had, uh, 15 or 16. And then you had an up month, and then you had another penny up month. And then uh, you actually, the up months have been really small. Uh, July ended up two cents. So you are seeing a few green candles uh, here on uh, the monthly charts, but uh, still a uh, long-term trend is down. And GE, Spencer, we kept you over time today. No, it's all right. Uh, I wanted to just mention that on tomorrow's show, we're going to be joined by Brad Longcar, uh, biotech expert, Longcar Investments is his firm. Uh, he just launched another uh, ETF. This I don't know how they got this t- this symbol CHNA. It is uh, looking at the Chinese biotech 
uh, space. So we're going to talk to talk to uh, Brad all about that. That'll be on tomorrow's show at 8. 35 but if you missed any part of uh today's show you can catch our podcast on itunes soundcloud stitcher tune in uh google or go on youtube.com slash and watch the show there uh thanks to our guests mark and bill thanks to all of you in our chats we want to remind you that all the information from our show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice we'll be joined back uh by dennis on tomorrow's show and that'll be it. So hope you guys enjoyed the show today. Hope you have a good rest of your day and we'll see you on Friday.